Hey everybody, Haku here with my read through for the second half of Magical Girl Raising Project or Mao Shoujo Weeks at Kekaku. Restart Chapter 10 Petchka and Creature World. And what a journey the, f the last video was. So Petchka went from Pinocchio to Wolverine to Sasori to Dead. Um, we found out that Melville is maybe the Demon Lord? He's at least a murderer. I mean, mur murderer confirmed, demon lord, probably? I don't know, she's been doing some weird stuff, though. Also, Lazaline doing some weird stuff and doesn't remember Clamberry. And ran off on her own. And Noko-chan also ran off on her own. Weird stuff. Um, unless Noko-chan just moiterized Lazaline, but I doubt it. Um, and then, of course, we have Petchka and Fled do- er, not Petchka and Fled, Shadow Veil and Fled doing their thing. Petchka tried to drown a bitch in cold soup, falling into the place below the wasteland. And, uh, there was that underground lake there that we saw before. And she got stabbed, so she's maybe sinking in that lake dying now. Maybe. And I think that's about where we are. I think that's the catch-up, the recap. Um... So yeah, now we are at page, the end of page 21, switching over to Melville. Melville despised Petchka. Her magical skill involved touching some, hold on. Her magical skill involved touching something with her palms, then she had to wait for five minutes before it can activate, meaning it was practically useless for battle. Melville judged that if she didn't do anything stupid like neglecting Petchka and allowing her to touch her for five minutes, then Petchka would be useless. How was she supposed to know that Petchka could broaden her range of effect? It was a bad idea to delay anything with her for five minutes, no matter what happens. She erased any thoughts of Petchka's magical skill from her mind and let her talk as much as she wanted, so the one who caused this in the end was Melville. Petchka pointed out that Melville was different from Clamberry, upsetting her. Melville tried to conceal her emotions, but did a poor job of it. If it weren't for that, she may have thought a little closer about Petchka's damn speech. She made her own bow and arrow, and while pursuing animals in the mountains, a beautiful musician girl descended. Even the mountain god, a huge bear, couldn't match her. Melville adored the forest musician. She wanted to be just like her, hoping that she could transform into her. Her wish was to become just like her. Melville adored Clamberry, worshipped her, but yet didn't choose the same way of life as Clamberry. No, she couldn't choose it. Melville's magical skill was the power to change the surface colors of an object. She can't make something that was supposed to be there disappear, and she can make and, er, she can make something that's not there seem there. She can deceive her enemy's sight, confuse them, a powerful magic that reduced their strength. She would deceive them, cheat, then shoot them down and kill them. That was Melville's style. However, that kind of magic won't work on Clamberry at all. Even if you found a technique that lets you move silently, Clamberry's hearing is far more sensitive than her vision. If it's a living creature, she can hear their heartbeat. Even if you didn't have that, she could activate her sonar by emitting acoustic waves. Against something like that, what use does, ma er, what use does magic that changes your appearance have on Clamberry? Clamberry's fundam fundamentals were to become strong. Melville's fundamentals were to seek strength in a different way, as she cannot reach Clamberry's. Plans, binding her, er, plans blinding her enemies, surprise attacks, betrayal, temporary cooperation. Occasionally she'd bribe them. As long as she could win, it was fine. After all, the last one standing is the strongest. She had a complex. She trained and practiced repeatedly until she was no longer a rookie, and felt like she was able, or she was finally getting closer to Clamberry, contrary to when she was originally recruited, believing she could not reach her level. The strongest is the greatest in all the mountains. Magical girls are stronger than anyone, the greatest. The strongest magical girl among magical girls would truly be the greatest among greats. She was chosen to be a magical girl in Clamberry's tests, and if necessary, she'd cooperate with her. She was different than the other magical girls. She didn't have her memories erased. Melville asked for that herself, and Clamberry accepted Melville. Okay, so Melville kept her memories. Also, I love that she wanted to be the strongest of the strong, even stronger than Clamberry. She admired Clamberry. But I like that this, me this means the whole made her bow and out in the woods thing was before she even met Clamberry and was chosen to be a magical girl. 
um, because then she met Clanberry and was chosen. So that means she was just some girl living out in the woods and such, or living way out in the country, I guess. Okay, moving along. Someday she wanted to become a magical girl who could surpass even Clanberry. Because of that, she continued to become a magical girl. Um, she broke down the walls. She couldn't. Her, she couldn't exceed. She broke down the walls. She couldn't exceed them. And when she was struggling, Clamberry, who should be stronger than anyone, was killed. What Clamberry was doing had exposed the had been exposed. The authorities' reach extended towards Melville. Her shock for Clamberry's death still hasn't disappeared, and her right to become a magical girl was revoked, returning her to a normal girl. And then the game started. Whoever this girl was, she gave her power to become a magical girl once again. For the forest musician, sorry, hiccup. For the forest musician, Clamberry to become strong. For her way of life, she regained what she had lost. When she saw the participants' faces, there were several that she was familiar with. She saw them while she was cooperating with Clamberry's tests. They were the winners of her tests, students who had their records kept by Fav. There were some faces that she didn't recognize, however, she was sure that everyone was all past winners of Clamberry's tests. Someone was collecting people who won Clamberry's tests and made them play the game. Does that mean Clamberry was still alive? Who would do something like this other than Clamberry? As if saying that Clamberry's death was a lie, or maybe it was just someone who wanted to be like Clamberry, someone strong like Clamberry couldn't die. Melville thought so, and that delighted her. Okay. Moving along. The other magical girls seem to think that this is just a game. No wonder. They didn't have their memories. Clamberry wouldn't do something like this, or something like stay safe but stay behind safe and secure and not participate in the game herself. They did receive an explanation that they had to work together to defeat the Demon Lord, but this is different than what Clamberry would want. This girl was gathering the winners inside this game, and from among them she wanted to select a real winner among winners. Of course, if anyone would be victorious, it had to be Melville. She pretended to be a normal player participating in the game, and when their backs are turned, she would kill them. If she fought Mast Wonder fairly, she, then she'd be a powerful opponent. She could tell by looking at what happened with Chair and a Mouse. Of course, her habit was never to fight directly from the front. She always had deceit by her side. She was thankful that Akane had eliminated... Um, she was thankful that Akane was eliminated without permission. Akane, who had a rage for Clamberry ever since she was hospitalized, seemed to remember memory fragments Every time she always said, musician, musician. Because of that, Melville was worried that someone else's memories might return. Genocyco and Magical Daisy both were arbitrarily eliminated. Genocyco, who couldn't be attacked at all, and a magical girl with extensive experience in a deadly weapon, Magical Daisy, both of them would be a troubling pair to deal with. Without those two, Melville was saved. Chernomouse was an easy target to handle and manipulate. She used her magical skill to monopolize hunting grounds, sowing seeds of discord between the parties, delaying the passage of information. She thought of using her until the very end, but Melville changed her mind when she saw Chair and a Mouse rush Fle's tank. Although it was against her ways, Melville had to do it. At Nyan Nyan, was she influenced by Akane? It seemed like her memories were coming back. Even if she didn't have her memories, her strength in defeating Akane was genuine. Um, Melville took care of that problem by using Genocyco's corpse in order to take out at Nyan Nyan, who always thought about her friends. And then she had to use her closest friend as at Nyan Nyan wouldn't let her er as at Nyan Nyan would let her guard down. First, Genocyco showed up in advance, leaving a message warning about a traitor. Afterward, Melville redecorated Genocyco's scarred face, making it so that the scar disappeared as Rionetta was manipulating her corpse making it seem like Genocyco survived, and making it seem like At Nyan Nyan was the traitor. Melville used Rionetta. Because she saw through the test that Rionetta went through, she knew what Rionetta deals in. She was a thrifty girl, so Melville offered her money. Naturally, the Land of Magic didn't know about this. Melville snuck into Rionetta's home, placing over 3 million yen on the table. When the game restarted, she revealed herself to be the one who gave her the 3 million in cash, 
adding that Noble wanted to help Rionetta repay her father's debt. While bribing with money, she threatened her by revealing where she, or she threatened her by revealing where she lived and detailed about and details about her family members. Thus, she used Rionetta to eliminate at Nyan Nyan. The remaining magical girls, and see that's why um, Rionetta was always pissed off, and um, really wanted the game to be over and the Demon Lord to die is because her family was at stake, and it also explains the. Um, the what have I done moment where she started losing it in the library. She started regretting helping, um, helping the demon lord. Okay. The remaining magical girls, Fle, she had only her pa she had only the power of speech. In addition, she lost her wheelchair. Shadow Gale, if all she could do was make tanks, then she wouldn't be a problem. Miyakata Nanako, she was dependent on monsters. Even with the dragon, Melville could kill her in a two on one. Detic, Detic Bell, her magical skill is useless in combat, and she couldn't even make it, or she couldn't even use it much in game. Petka, out of the question. The tough one would be Lazaline. The first Lapis Lazaline was among the best veterans of Clamberry Says, Ah, this is why she doesn't remember Clamberry, because the first Lazaline was the uh, test veteran, but she passed it on to the second one, which means that the master. Keek might not know that this Lapis Lazuline isn't the first one. Okay. Before she became a magical girl, she lived her life like a ghost, without a care in the world. Mulville saw traces of the first Lapis Lazuline in the latest one. Lazuline isn't weak, and her intuition was also a threat to Melville. How will she eliminate Lazuline? As she thought of all that, all the player's memories returned, so now Melville's lost her advantage. If she could have instantly killed Detic Bell, then she might have been able to steal her magical phone. Now, she had to prepare for what's ahead. Okay, so this is all interesting. Before I read that last paragraph, before the little scene break, um, this makes me wonder. They said that two of them in there were dangerous. I so think the other one's going to be Fla, because I think she killed the 98 people to have her and Shadow Gale go through, and also her power... She lied about what Shadow Gale's power was, so I think there's no reason she wouldn't lie about her own power. Because we saw that um, if her power is the wheelchair, then it's kind of pointless because um, a new wheelchair could just be made out of any old chair from Shadow Gale. And that explains why she didn't get Shadow Gale to make another wheelchair, because if she did, then it would give away that that's not actually her power. So I still think that... Um, Melville has something, uh, something coming when she tries to take on Fla. when, uh, we see what Fla's real power is. Um, at least that's what I would be thinking here. Moving along, though. In this situation, Melville couldn't do anything that would cause her suspicion among the players. Melville became a magical girl with the hopes of wanting to become like Clamberry. Her vines, roses, and sharp ears were all for the sake of looking like Clamberry, just because they look similar doesn't mean she'll automatically be accused, but there were no mistaking the marks she's made, so now it was impossible to do more than this. Melville despised Petchka. Because she violently retaliated, Melville couldn't reach her goal. It wasn't an immediate game set and match. Melville stabbed Petchka with a harpoon. Finally, she loosened her restraints. Finally, Melville disappeared and left Petchka, and then she heard something landing. There was a splash. Clantail. She seems to have jumped down from the hole that Petchka made. Her lower body was that of a fish. No, actually, it's a dolphin. She kicked the water with her large tail fin, diving straight for Petchka. Now, this is sad because I feel like I feel like Melville's going to kill Clantail. So I'm going to be very upset. Um, okay, diving straight for Petchka. Melville ignored Clantail. And, well, I guess this still doesn't explain yet. I know it will be explained eventually. Because it obviously has to be. Still doesn't explain what's going on yet with Lazuline and Noka-chan. So, I'm moving along. Mulva ignored Clantail, climbing for the shores instead. Wet traces, footprints, and her own body were all cleverly erased, as if nothing had happened. She moved around the lake. Clantail was operating her magical phone. She was trying to treat Petchka's wounds. Petchka was barely breathing. Admittedly, she hadn't died yet from the stab wound. Oh yeah, that's true. Because they technically have the healing medicine that she could spam on her. 
While invisible, Melville moved around the lake, getting into position behind Clantail. As Clantail embraced Petchka, she wasn't aware of Melville, for unprotected back would make a good target. There was no possibility for Clantail to notice Melville pulling her bowstring. Magical girls, not just Clanberry, have developed their five senses. Naturally, their hearing was also excellent. Even though it was wide, they were still in a closed space. They were involved in a cave-in, so she couldn't help but get involved now. This was the correct usage of a harpoon, thrown by hand. By the time Clantail would notice the flying sound, she'd be pierced by the invisible harpoon. Mulva moved slowly as to not make any sounds, and she threw the harpoon towards Clantail's back. Interesting to see what will happen here, but I'm not thinking anything good. Petchka then. Petchka woke up. Clantail was embr- Clantail's gonna die right in front of Petchka, isn't she? Petchka woke up. Clantail was embracing her. She tried to remember what happened, and, and recalled that she had been stabbed by a harpoon. Petchka looked at her belly. A hole had been ripped into her clothes, its edges stained red with blood, but there was no pain even if she touched it. There was no damage. Oh, thank goodness. Clantail was smiling, with tears streaming down her face. Her face was close to her, because she was being embraced. Her lower body had transformed into a dolphin. Clantail's transformation patterns were pretty cute. Classifying her to be similar to a deer or a pony made Petchka feel silly. It was then she smelled something. The, surround, the surrounding scent, as well as the scent drifting on Petchka's body, was in the air. Even though she looked around, there was nothing there. Before she knew what happened, Petchka began to move. She turned Clantail around, using the hands on her shoulders, switching places with Clantail underwater. Oh my god. Petchka, the, the sense of smell. I got the sense of smell coming in clutch. Petchka received a heavy shock from the back of her body. She felt like she was going to be torn apart. Pain, heat, cold, suffering, fear. Petchka began to fall into darkness with various negative emotions. However, there was one thing that glowed brightly. Petchka could finally move when it mattered. She protected an important friend. She was satisfied with that. Petchka quietly closed her eyes. Petchka, coming in clutch when it matters. While Petchka... While Petchka closed her eyes, she saw her friends. She saw her family, too. Nako and Rionetta were arguing. Clantail calmed them down. Nina Miyakun was there. The girl that Nina Miyakun reminded Petchka of was here, too. Everyone was smiling. Petchka was smiling, too. It was pleasant. It was fun. And Petchka was happy. That was so good. Oh, my God. Yes, Petchka. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. And now that Petchka... When she uh, sees the girl that Nina Miyakun reminded her of that she couldn't remember. Yes. Oh, my God. That was so good. Oh, my gosh. That was probably the best scene so far in the series. That was so good. Petchka, and it was foreshadowed so long ago with Petchka smelling the flowers in the wasteland. That was so good. Okay, back to Melville. Once again, Petchka caused her problems. The harpoon that was supposed to pierce Clantail's back, because of Petchka switching places, pierced Petchka's back instead. Clantail, who now noticed Melville's presence, dived under the water toward Petchka again before Melville could throw a second harpoon. That's right, once again Petchka. Melville spat on a rock. Even if she tried to calm her mind, it was a raging storm, likely boiling with humiliation and anger. Petchka hadn't noticed her, or er, Clantail hadn't noticed her, but Petchka did. Petchka detected her presence and her movements and blocked the harpoon with her own back. There should be a reason why only Petchka noticed her. Melville had killed all, had killed all sound. If they weren't on the level of Clanberry, it was impossible to detect her by sound. If it wasn't sight or hearing, then the only other sense is smell. Because Clanberry's magical skill, skill is to manipulate sound, she had incredible super hearing, and Petchka's ability is making food. Does that mean she had an excellent sense of smell? Finally, having some answers to why she failed, her mind calmed down. Melville picked up her harpoon. No matter how many times she shot, Melville's harpoons will, will never run out. Sorry, my face itches. There was no movement on the water's surface. Clantail hasn't reappeared ever since she dove into the water. Was Petchka alive? Was she dead? There was finally a response. She's finally dead. What was Clantail doing when Petchka died? 
Surely she was trying to attack Melville. However, Melville had disappeared and Clantail had no skill in finding her. Melville placed her hands on the rocks. She couldn't sense movement in the water. Okay. Melville wondered if she should run away. In the wilderness, Melville won't lose to anyone. If possible, she'd rather not fight in the underground. It was narrow. If she seriously shot her harpoon, it might cause a cave-in. People would know that Melville was involved. But, if she ran away now, the surviving magical girls will, will unite. Preferably, she'd rather pick them off one by one, rather than fighting multiple people. She decided it'd be better to fight her opponents while suppressing their fighting power. Melville looked up at the ceiling. Because of Petchka's magic, a giant hole had been opened. During her battle with Clantail, it was the first time she pulled her bowstrings at full power since she entered the game. Thanks to the Miracle Coin, she obtained the rare items Amulet of Power and the Fiend's Bow. Thanks to them, she destroyed buildings and made craters on the ground. She was glad its power was high, but if she fought like that, then the other magical girls might notice. If she could silently kill them, they might not come here. The water surface was shaking. There was a ripple. Melville concentrated. If she threw straight in front of her, then her disappearance loses half its meaning. Standing with only her toes, she bent her back in order to keep up with Clamberry. She'd learned silent movement techniques, until eventually not even Clamberry's hearing could pick it up. That was the basis of Melville's struggles. From the other side of the shore, Clantail's head appeared over twenty meters away, then her shoulders until finally her torso. She held Petchka in both her arms. Petchka wasn't moving in Clantail's arms, her limbs limply hanging from the side. Because Clantail was looking down, Melville couldn't see her expression from here. Clantail's arms were occupied holding Petchka. Melville turned to Clantail's right side at the same time observing Petchka. The blood flowing from behind her back made Clantail dirty. Her wounds could not be treated. In addition, her face, her hands, it was faded in pale blue rather than white. Melville has seen this over and over in Clanberry's tests. Petchka is dead. Okay. Now what I'm thinking here is Clantail better not die after Petchka sacrificed herself. I am going to be so pissed at Clantail if she fucks this up after Petchka sacrificed herself. Okay, Petchka is dead. While Clantail's lower body was submerged underwater, Melville approached. Before she... Hold on. Just checking stuff. Before she would go to shore, Melville shouldn't kill her while she, while she won't be able to move freely in the water. Melville should kill her while she won't be able to move freely in the water. Melville moved to Clantail's right side, gripped her harpoon. There was approximately 30 meters to her target. It was a reasonable distance. Melville held her harpoon, and on the edge of her eyesight she saw Lazaline. Lazaline, are you really the demon lord, Melly? Lazaline immediately appeared next to Clantail. She looked directly at Melville, who should have been invisible. Her eyes were stained with anger. It was, distract it was distracted while staring at her face. For the first time, Melville saw Lazaline angry, and Melville stepped back. She felt the pressure. It was only for a short while, but she was confused. Melville's skill was making things that weren't supposed to be there appear. No other magical girl has that skill. Clantail looked in the same direction as Lazaline, turning her... F Hold on. Okay. Has that skill. Clantail looked in the same direction as Lazaline, turning her face to where Melville was. Lazaline threw a, sparking, a sparkling blue ball and immediately teleported towards it and caught it in the air, throwing it again to the air and teleporting and catching it again. And within seconds, she was right in front of Melville. Are you the demon lord, Melly? Did you kill Belzy, Melly? Melville was invisible. She made no sound, yet Lazaline was talking directly to Melville. Melville's whereabouts were compromised. Melville took a deep breath. She breathed in the damp air around the underwater lake. She was trying to keep her head held high. Puzzlement, confusion, astonishment. She was trying to bury all those feelings inside. When she was scouting in the demon lord's castle, Lazaline had handed Clantail one of her gems. Hold on. Into one of her gems. Was it supposed to be a type of insurance that Lazaline would come to her if there was any trouble? And so, that gem, did Clantail use it to summon Lazaline to her? If that was so, Melville didn't see any exchange like that between them. When Clantail was diving in the water, she wasn't just trying to avoid Melville's attack and heal Petka, she was sending a text to Lazaline asking her to come help her. 
Vaseline responded accordingly, teleporting instantly to the gem that Clantail had kept with her. The only problem now was how Lazeline knew Melville's position. Melville threw her harpoon. Lazeline gracefully dodged it and ran straight to Melville. Intuition? What's going on? Is that what's going on? Melville looked at Clantail. She was able to reach the shoreline. Clantail's magical skill was to transform her lower half into any creature other than humans. It didn't matter if it were mammals, insects, amphibians, fish, arachnids, so long as it's a living organism and an animal. However, the transformation cuts off at her upper half, and her upper body will always be Clantail's normal body. Melville also knew much about Clantail. That's because Melville assisted the, clam, the Clamberry test that Clantail participated in. During that test, Clantail turned into a variety of animals, all from the neck down. Her head never transformed into an animal. The animal's nerve center was also usually from the... Hold on. All from the neck down. Her head never transformed to an animal. An animal's nerve center was usually from the neck top, but sometimes there were some that had them in their torso. Those animals didn't have any special super sensitive organs. None of them, sh them should have been able to catch the level of Melville's silent movements. A snake's heat vision, a dog's sense of smell, a bat's echolocation. These animals would be a threat to Melville. But if Clantail wanted to use those abilities, she'd need her head to be transformed meaning Clantail's magical skill wasn't a threat to Melville. If Melville can defeat Lazeline, she may still have a chance of fighting, er, of killing Clantail. Clantail softly laid down Petchka's body on the shore. She looked towards Melville with a face of scorn. Clantail was staring at Melville with the look of an enraged beast. Melville! <laughs> Clantail roared out and ran, her lower body is that of a lion. The reason she wasn't a horse was because the surface of the area was slippery, so she must have decided it'd be dangerous to use hooves. She'll be here soon. Even if Melville was invisible, if she fought with Lazeline, Clantel can easily deduce her position, forcing her into a two-on-one. She had to deal with Lazeline first, blocking a kick with her large bow. She had no time. Melville focused on Clantel's feet, changing the color of the rocky area to black all over. It wouldn't reflect light, perfect black. Because of this, Clantil won't be able to tell which parts of the rocks were rough or not, making it hard for her to run fast. Did she slow down, or was she so full of anger that she continued to speed up? Was she confused or only mildly bothered? At the very least, Melville wanted to buy some time. Using that earned time, she'll kill Lazeline. Melville blocked the jab, hook, uppercut, and straight combos, all blocked by Melville's palms. Melville threw away her big bow. At this distance, it'll only be a burden. Melville swung the harpoon on her right hand towards Lazeline's feet, but it was stopped by Lazeline's foot. Even against Melville and her harpoon, who were all invisible, it didn't seem like Lazeline was at a disadvantage. Lazeline's sharp intuition had been trained by her predecessor. It was as if Lazeline was fighting to the death. Melville couldn't believe it. Even if Lazeline was attacked from behind, she'll dodge it. Even if Lazeline was suddenly attacked, she'd sense it. After all, she was able to sense the invisible traps so of course her stature was strong. One second has passed. What was the first Lazeline thinking? She was an old and vindictive woman. What was she thinking, training a magical girl, passing on her own name and teaching her to fight as if it was kill or be killed? She trained and had no care in the world and secluded herself. Was she trying to leave a sacrificial lamb in place of herself? That's actually, it might not be Flay who was the second girl that um, Snow White noticed. Maybe it's Lazeline. Again though, if Lazeline and or Clantail die after Petchka sacrificed, I'ma be pissed. Petchka bought them this moment. Petchka bought them this. So they best not be losing here. Um, so either way. Because she was fighting in a kill-or-be-killed situation, Lazeline's fists were powerful, accurate and no hesitation. She hit Melville's shoulder and punched her cheeks, her hair flailing. Melville stopped moving silently, her motions, her clothing, her breathing, all were now free. She punched back, kicked back, thrusted, counterattacked, rotated, used her fists, blocked with her elbows. When she was hit in the wrist, she blocked it, but she couldn't stop the momentum, thus the blow traveled through and punched Melville in the neck. Lazeline had no fear, so Melville thrust her harpoon. Shame for Lazeline's thighs, but she stopped it with her foot. Melville stepped on Lazeline's heels, crushing her right leg. 
Okay. Two seconds have passed. So now Lazuline's right leg is crushed, but Melville should be beat the hell up. Really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Melville should be beat up by now. Two seconds have passed. Lazuline didn't raise her voice. She didn't even show any signs of pain. Lazuline grasped the gem on her right hand without hesitation, cracking the gem and spreading its fragments around the area. Before Melville could understand why she did that, Lazuline had disappeared, and Melville's back was struck. Melville's ribs cracked. Her kidneys were damaged, too. When she waved her harpoon backwards, Lazuline wasn't there. Melville raised her arms, trying to guard an attack to her forehead, but while she wanted to counterattack, Lazuline disappeared again. Melville's throat was struck, her shoulders, her shoulder, arms, thighs as well, and other than the first strike, Melville was able to avoid large amounts of damage by predicting and avoiding the attacks, but she still couldn't counterattack, repeatedly being beaten up like some sort of punishment. She was beaten down. Even though Lazuline was just one, it felt like there were multiple Lazulines attacking her. The shards of the blue gem shimmered. All of them were Lazuline's weapons. Lazuline was able to teleport from shard to shard so fast that after images began to overlap each other, there wasn't any chance for Melville to counterattack. Three seconds have passed. Melville fell to the ground. It seemed like she couldn't stand Lazuline's repeated attacks. It seems like she collapsed due to her unbalanced back, but of course it wasn't true. Melville will never stop fighting due to pain or injury. Melville's every movement was always aimed at her victory. Even though she was a cow she was a coward and despicable, she wasn't ashamed at choosing a way of life like Clamberry. Melville placed her back on the ground. With this, her blind spot in the back is gone. The rock was cold or the rock was hard, cold, stained with cracks. She was assured that Lazuline would give the final blow to the weakened and fallen Melville and that she would appear and that she would appear. That's when Melville will attack. However, if she attacks now, she wouldn't win. Lazuline's injuries and Melville's injuries. Lazuline's stance and Melville's position. Lazuline's power and Melville's power. And the timing selected by Lazuline, all of them had to be taken together in an instant. It'd be meaningless if she waited too long. All Melville needed was victory. Shamed for victory and just a little bit more. So she's pretty much just laying flat on her back on the ground at this point. Four seconds have passed. Lazuline appeared at the same time Melville appeared. Her body has, that has been invisible this whole time, now in color. Her body, image, shadow, all of them look crazy, and Melville made a false image of herself. Lazuline thrust her legs, ready to trample the collapsed Melville. While she was trampling, Melville thrust her harpoon, intersecting her. Although Melville didn't name the harpoon, it pierced through Lazuline's ribs and stabbed her through the heart. Lazuline looked down at Melville, the anger in her eyes burning, and her eyes reflecting Melville, who was crawling on the ground. Melville, who had been invisible the whole fight, had taken direct attacks, suddenly showing herself lying on her stomach and causing Lazuline to be too bold. Lazuline wanted to do a blow to end the fight, aiming at her vitals, launching an attack with a huge motion, but because of that, Melville's harpoon was waiting the whole time. That's when she decided to appear to Lazuline. Okay. Okay. Got it. If she sustained a perfect visual image, Lazuline probably would catch on. However, this time, Melville just reversed the back and front of her body. She was actually there. She used herself as a decoy, succeeding in making a small opening to attack Lazuline. Lazuline, who had been pierced through the heart, still hit her original attack to Melville. Melville was somewhat weakened. Lazuline had hit her vital spot. Five seconds have passed. So Lazuline and Melville are about to kill each other. And what I'm worried about now, we have four girls left. Bam, someone else is going to turn. Because Melville said she was trying to kill everyone. She said she was trying to be the longest, or er, the strongest. But she never once said she was the demon lord. So I am so afraid right now that just it's going to be like, man, Clan Tail, Flesh, Shadow Gale, and Noku Chan are left, and then one of those four is going to turn on the other three. Man, she made it in time. Clan Tail still hadn't arrived yet. 
puzzling collapsed and in exchange Melville stood up. How can she stand up though? She's been hitting her vitals and her ribs are broken and her kidneys are damaged. There's a lot. How is she alive here? Lazuline collapsed and in exchange Melville stood up. Immediately she disappeared. This wouldn't end just by defeating Lazuline. Lazuline's blood, Melville's blood, all of them were erased, leaving only Lazuline. If Clantel were to approach Lazuline to help her, Melville would pierce her and end it there. The rock shook. Clantel kicked up. She jumped from the from the black ground. Foolish. It's better for Melville if Clantel jumped. She was twenty meters away. Clantel's lower body swelled up. She was trying to transform. She won't make it in time. Of the creatures that could attack at that distance, none of them were faster than Melville's harpoon. Melville's blow will puncture Clantail before Clantail's would hit Melville. Clantail's lower abdomen bulged. It became strong scales that shined red. Furthermore, there were front legs that protruded. Sharp claws appeared that were the size of a small human. The thickness of her tail was about the size of a drum. How many people could fit inside that? Huge wings popped out from behind her body. The surface of the water rippled with the intense wind pressure. Melville remembered this. How could she forget? The great dragon. Melville's hand that was grabbing the harpoon shook. She couldn't aim. She wanted to aim at her upper body, but Clantail was in the sky. Her huge lower body covered up her smaller upper body. She couldn't fight like this. Melville had to move while she was invisible. Due to the great dragon's huge body, Melville couldn't expect much damage from her harpoon. With this distance, she could only destroy buildings and cause craters if she used her large bow. When Melville tried to move, something grabbed her ankle. Lazuline was putting her hands on Melville's ankle. Lazuline's face was still collapsed on the ground, dipped within her own blood puddle. She was dead. The hand grabbing her ankle was also that of a dead person. Its temperature was cold. Yet it still moved. What well, was this an obsession? A grudge? Before Melville could react, she had been sliced by the great dragon's claws. While still being invisible, her entire body had been sliced into several parts, splashing into the lake, filling it with blood. Okay, that was great. Clantail finally got the kill, killed Melville, and Lazuline, so great. I am pissed that Lazuline is dead, though, given that the first Lazuline went through all this shit to make the second Lazuline just to have the second Lazuline die and not be able to carry on the Lazuline line kind of bugs me. But holy damn, that was good. That fight was incredible. And everything, everything from Petchka Sacrifice. Petchka Sacrifice, best scene so far. That was so good. Uh, now we're at thir page 35. Okay. Um, hang on just one second. Going to make a quick jump cut here. Okay, made a quick jump cut there to save the file of what I had recorded so far, just because no taking chances in case of an emergency. No taking chances with that. That was too good. Um, so yeah, let's move on. We're at page 35 in Shadow Gale now. So uh, Shadow Gale, with Plague gone, Shadow Gale's back felt lighter. If she felt any danger, she should run away. She figured it'd be stupid to resist those commands. There were no ab Either Noko-chan's gonna bam, bad guy turn, possibility. I really hope Clantail doesn't do a bad guy turn. I don't see that happening. Um, I, I could see it with Noko-chan. <laughs> Either bam, Noko-chan bad guy turn, or Keek is going to come in and ruin our happiness. Because I'm happy that four girls survived. But, oh man. Even though I'm happy four girls survived, I'm just, I'm prepared for it to get worse. Even though we had eight at the beginning of this chapter, remembering back to the beginning of the first part, half of the cast has just died in this chapter. Half of the remaining cast, at least. Either way. Well, danger runs, there were no abnormalities, even if there wasn't anything weird. While she looked around the area, observing everything one by one, she progressed slowly. Speaking of strangeness, it was strange that Noko-chan had separated herself. If Noko-chan was behind all of them, she should have seen Lazuline disappear so there was no reason for her to silently depart from the group. On Shadow Gale's left hand was the dragon shield, on her right was the wrench plus seven. <laughs> and I love the weapons. And no matter where she would be attacking from, she'd be fully prepared. Instead of running around, she was walking in the wasteland area. Noko-chan's icon wasn't far, it was a build in a building about a hundred meters ahead, over there. Shadow Gale broke her pace, she closed in on the building while being on full alert. 
finally reaching it. She touched the walls of the building. It was rough. It was just an abandoned building. There were many of them littered throughout the wasteland area, and it wasn't any different from the other wasteland buildings. It was just an object. She confirmed Nokuchan's position using her magical phone. She hasn't changed er she hasn't changed at all ever since she launched the application. It was still in the same position. Shadow Gale pocketed her magical phone and took out her wrench. While its function was to confirm where party members were, they didn't display the locations of their actual person, just their magical phones. There's of course a possibility that a magical phone was placed there to lure her into a trap. Regardless of whether Noko-chan was there, there was someone who could have used Noko-chan's magical phone. Shadow Gale went along the walls to the front of the building. Her speed was now slower than ever. Slow, attentive, and no matter how small of a sound she'd hear, she'd be careful not to miss it. Steadily, she took a step forward. There was no sound. Even though there was no sound, she noticed a smell. She remembered that smell. In the underground area's final floor, the scene of the magical girls fighting there came to her mind. Something was burning, and she could smell it. From the front of the building, she looked inside. She saw a black lump there. Where did it come from? Its shape was also unclear. It looked ju it just looked like a lump. Its size was about the size of a human body. The floor was also black with soot. They must have burnt it here. There was a magical phone that was dropped by its side. That magical phone had something else on it. When Shadow Gale saw what it was, she immediately closed her eyes. Even though she was pa carefully paying attention up, up to this point, she closed her eyes during the most important moment. Was it because she wanted to say that she didn't see what she just saw? Or was it because she wanted to look away from reality? It was a girl's hand, cut from the wrist, and on that girl's hand she was gripping a magical phone tightly. Okay, from her wrist all the way to the back of her hand, it was all burnt black. The owner of this hand, there was only one girl among the players, it was a very small, childlike hand, and even though Shadow Gale closed her eyes, that image was burnt into her mind. Okay... So Noko-chan has been burnt to death. Five out of the eight have been killed. So either somebody is still in there burning people to, to death and this is not good, or what I'm very scared of is that Fle made the same deal again for the two of them to survive by killing everyone, and that Fle's going to kill Clantail. Just to let my girl Clantail survive. She has been through a lot. Petchka died for her. I just really want Petchka's... Um, Petchka's sacrifice to not be made in vain. So, um, gosh. Please, do not let Fle be a bad guy here. Either, I'm trying to think of who it could be. I guess it's gotta be... It's gotta be, um... It can't be Flame Flamey who had flame powers, because Snow White already took her down. Um, gosh, I don't know who it could be, unless it's Fle. And I hope it's not Fla. I really hope it's not. And it could be the Master, definitely. But now we have the Master's side. Um, going into, like, three more pages. Wow. Okay. Master's side. I've been waiting for you. The automatic door that she had created slid open smoothly, inviting her guest inside. It did so because the girl made it that way. It made a quiet sound. The door's sliding motion was smooth. It was something rather commonplace. The girl nodded, satisfied. The magical phone on the desk activated. A synthetic speech cried out, Snow White, oh, you're just annoying. Shut up. The girl snapped her fingers. The magical phone lost power. Her guest gazed from left to right, probably concerned why all the monitors arranged in the room displayed only black screens. Thanks to the darkness in the room, the only light was leaking through the slits on the automatic door. The girl moved her right arm sideways, dropping everything on the dropping everything on the desk to the floor, monitors and notes. Her magical phone, her pencil and her pen stands all fell down. The dust that had gathered on the floor floated upwards. The girl lifted her back from the chair with a smile. She spread her palms and presented the chair. Please, after you. The girl invited her guest, the white magical girl Snow White, who took three steps from the entrance and pulled the chair. She sat down. When the girl snapped her fingers, on the table appeared a white cup with a color that looked as fresh as snow, and inside the cup was a liquid with young leafy colors. Snow White, since you didn't seem to like the café au lait before, I assume you prefer green tea. 
Snow White didn't care much for the girl's hospitality. She didn't touch the cup. The girl closed one eye. Even though it must have pained her, she thought it felt interesting. Actually, the game is about to end soon. Snow White's expression changed for the first time. Surprised, the girl opened the eye she closed and looked at Snow White. The girl nodded, took a teacup, and drank it. I'm not joking, it's true, honest. Will the Demon Lord win? Will the players win? Either way, the game will end soon. Then, shall we see? Wonder what's going to happen, hmm? What do you think, hmm? Snow White's expression returned. She had no emotions on her face. Surprisingly bitter, isn't it? asked the girl. She placed the cup back on its saucer. Of course, if the game ends, we'll have to finish up discussions and go back home, right? You know, originally I didn't want to negotiate with the Land of Magic. I just wanted to change the Land of Magic system. But I realize how many years it'll take to change the fundamental basis of the Land of Magic. The girl snapped her fingers. The green liquid in the cup turned black, filling itself with foam. The girl took the cup and put it towards her mouth. Ah, this is much better, she said as she smiled. As I was saying, I don't intend to wait that long. I mean, can you imagine if we waited that long? Then plenty more rogue magical girls would be unleashed, right? That's why I didn't want to negotiate with the Land of Magic. The Land of Magic would ignore them. They'd do as they please, or they'd have them do as they please. The girl raised her right hand about the height of her face. Dust gathered at her fingertips. She drew in the air, creating a spiral pattern. That pattern turned into a square shape, a cube puzzle with a 9 by 9 square. The cube puzzle rotated without touching the girl's fingers. On one side of the cube, there was nothing on it. See this blank spot? It's going to tell us who the winner of the game is. The girl smiled, her glasses slipping off as she did. She supported it, er, she supported it back using her index finger. Do you know what you want? See this small square? I can make a brand new world. And I can reproduce a magical girl's data. All of this is possible for me. Snow White didn't reply. She only listened to the girl silently. The girl continued. During Clanberry's final test, her mascot left records. I stole those records from the Land of Magic. That includes data on all the magical girls who participated in her tests. Snow White was slightly stunned. Do you know where I'm going with this? Lapiselle, Hardcore Alice, the other magical girls too. I can reproduce them inside the game. Nothing with ch nothing will change. It's as if they all come back to life. They'll have all their memories, perfect copies. And I don't really know if this happens, but perhaps they, meet, they may even have their souls back too. I can do it, you know. It's a special gift, just for you, Snow White. The girl lifted her back from her chair, placing her hands on the desk, gazing at Snow White. The distance between their two faces were closer than two centimeters. Snow White's bangs waved as the girl breathed down on her. I want to negotiate with you, Snow White. Let's extend our hand. Let's change the world together. Let's create a world filled with ideal magical girls. Don't fall for it, Snow White. Don't do it. Do not. Do not do it, Snow White. But, um, yeah. Holy damn. We just lost five out of eight of them. And if she can recreate people in the game world, maybe that means that somebody did get a bonus life and that's who the Demon Lord is. Or if Fle's the Demon Lord and if Fle kills Clanberry, I'm going to be pissed off. Um, but yeah, we have one more chapter to see how this ends. Hopefully it ends with Snow White kicking some ass. That's how I would like to see it end. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Going to go ahead and end this. Like if you did like the video, comment down there. Tell me what you thought of this week's, uh, or, well, the second of this week's videos. Um, and... Yeah, anything you want to comment. Uh, subscribe for more Magical Girl Raising Project, much more. Next up, we will be doing episodes. Then I'll do a video talking about my favorite characters from Restart. And then uh, we'll move on to the next one, which I think is limited, but I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, that's it. Follow on Twitter if you want. I'll try to keep you updated there and stuff for the channel. Um, or if you want to link to our Discord server, just comment down there and ask, and I'll give it to you in the comments. That's it. Thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.